Hi, I'm Frank Lavallo, host of Novel Conversations. Before we start the show, we'd like to thank Visible Voice Books for sponsoring the Novel Conversations giveaway, which gives listeners a chance to win all eight classic novels featured in our fifth season. You can enter through our Novel Conversations Facebook page or tweet us at novel underscript converse, that's C-O-N-V-E-R-S, or head to our website blog, thefrontporchpeople.com backslash blog. Visible Voice Books is our local go-to for delving into our favorite books in a relaxed, inviting environment. And if you're not here in Cleveland, Ohio, you can always support Visible Voice Books by shopping online at visiblevoicebooks.com. Visible Voice Books. Without literature, life is hell. All right, up next, Novel Conversations. Frank Lavallo, and this is Novel Conversations, a podcast about the world's greatest stories. For each episode of Novel Conversations, I talk to two readers about one book, and together we summarize the story for you. We introduce you to the characters, we tell you what happens to them, and we read from the book along the way. So if you love hearing a good story, you're in the right place. This Novel Conversation is about Main Street by Sinclair Lewis, and I'll be joined by our Novel Conversations readers, Katie Smith and Peter Toomey. Katie, Peter, hello. Thank you. Hey, Frank, thanks. Katie, Peter, before we start our conversation, let me read you a brief summary of our novel. Written by Sinclair Lewis in 1918 and published in 1920, Main Street is the story of Carol Milford. It is the story of her marriage to Dr. Will Kennicott of Gopher Prairie, Minnesota, and it is the story of Gopher Prairie. Gopher Prairie is Sinclair Lewis's any small town America with a population of about 3,000 citizens. It's made up of a small downtown with its main street and a residential area surrounded by tenant farms run by the newly immigrated Swedes and Germans. How Carol reacts to Gopher Prairie, and just as importantly, how Gopher Prairie reacts to Carol, make up the bulk of our story, Main Street. All right, Katie, as far as I'm concerned, this novel really has three main characters. Carol Milford, the man she marries, Dr. Will Kennicott, and Gopher Prairie, Minnesota. But first, let's talk about Carol. And we meet her in the very first paragraph on the very first page. Katie, tell us a little bit more about Carol Milford. We meet Carol as she's graduating from college. We quickly learn that her parents died quite a few years ago, and she knows that she has to go out into the world and make it her own. But she has no idea how she's going to do that. Actually, Peter, the problem is she has too many ideas. She wants to be a sociologist. She wants to be a lawyer. She wants to be a screenplay writer. You get no solid feeling about Carol when we first meet her. Actually, Peter, there's a passage early in the book. Uh, She's living in Chicago, working in a library. And as she's walking through the town, she's looking at the suburban architecture. And all of a sudden, she remembers. She remembered her desire to recreate villages. She right then decides, I'm going to give up library work. And by a miracle whose nature is not really clear, I'm going to turn a prairie town into Georgian houses and Japanese bungalows. And then the next day in the library, she has to read a theme on the use of cumulative indexes. She takes that discussion so seriously. She forgets about town planning, and she's right back at work in the library. Yeah, and we should say that when she finally does make a decision about a career, she does pick library science. I think I'm going to have to start defending Carol right away. I don't know how many people today know what they want to do with the rest of their lives the day they graduate from college. And Katie, let's be fair to Carol. Women at that time really had limited choices in what they could do. Right. Here's a quote from the book. Quote, Daily on the library steps or in the hall of the main buildings, the co-eds talked of, what shall we do when we finish college? Even the girls who knew that they were going to be married pretended to be considering important business decisions. Even they who knew they would have to go to work hinted at fabulous suitors. As for Carol, she was an orphan. And she was not in love. That is not often or ever long at a time. (laughs) She would earn her living. So she was very clear-headed about her choices. Correct. And as we said, Carol does make a choice. She becomes a librarian. And three or four years later, she's working as a librarian in St. Paul, I believe, and a man comes into her life. Peter, do you want to tell us a little bit about Dr. Will Kennicott? Well, Dr. Kennicott is a friend to a friend of Carol's, a couple that lives in St. Paul. Carol is a regular dinner guest of theirs, and it becomes apparent that on this particular night, 
they've sort of arranged for Carol and Dr. Kennicott to meet at their house. Quickly apparent. Yeah, Dr. Kennicott is about 36 years old. He's a doctor in a small town, Gopher Prairie, a few hours train ride from Minneapolis. And this is how Carol remembers her first sighting of Dr. Kennicott. Quote, a thick, tall man of 36 or 7 with stolid brown hair, lips used to giving orders, eyes which followed everything good-naturedly, and clothes which you could never quite remember. Carol also saw in Kennicott someone who was sophisticated, yet lived in one of these small towns, which she was starting to believe was her destiny to go and beautify, to metropolize. And Carol does marry Dr. Will Kennicott. They go on a whirlwind honeymoon, and eventually they do have to come to Gopher Prairie, and it starts with a long and agonizing train ride. And that ride is full of all the people whom she will meet in Gopher Prairie. These are going to be her neighbors? Well, not specifically, but certainly the types of people. Poor farmers, poor Scandinavian immigrants, and as they pass through every small, dusty, depressing town. They're small and depressing to Carol, that's for sure. Yeah, well, she keeps asking, Will, well, what do you think about this town as compared to Grofer Prairie? And he says, oh, well, that's not such a bad town. And she becomes a bit alarmed. And then he continues, Oh, but Gopher Prairie, we've got our seven miles of (laughs) cement sidewalks, and we have a longer Main Street. And she starts to become concerned that Gopher Prairie is just like these dozens of small, dusty, depressing towns that they're passing. And in fact, Gopher Prairie is one of those small, dusty, depressing towns. By the time she gets to Main Street, she's almost in full-blown panic. Quote, she was here. It was the end, the end of the world. She sat with closed eyes, longing to push past Kennicott, hide somewhere in the train, flee on towards the Pacific. Something large arose inside her soul and commanded, stop it. Stop being a whiny baby. She stood up quickly and she said, isn't it wonderful to be here at last? See, so you've got to remember that the people on the train, well, all they heard was, Isn't it wonderful to be here at last? They didn't know what was going on inside her head. And we do have to make sure that that's clear, the whining and the complaining. And there's a lot of that. And there will be a lot of that. And it's really all her internal thoughts. It's what she's thinking without saying out loud. Correct, right. And also, let's be clear about Dr. Will Kennicott. He's not completely blind to the shortcomings of Gopher Prairie. He knows it's a small town. He knows it's different from what Carol is used to. In fact, he implores her to come to the town, make some changes, make this a better place for us to live. He says, come on, come to Gopher Prairie. Show us. Make the town. Well, we'll make it artistic. Go for it. Make us change. But Peter, once she's brought to her new home and is somewhat terrified by that prospect, she decides uh, she needs to go out and explore this town that's about to become her home. And so she heads down Main Street. She does. Tell me how Sinclair Lewis writes it. Quote, When Carol had walked for 32 minutes, she had completely covered the town, east and west, north and south, and she stood at the corner of Main Street and Washington Avenue and despaired. And Katie, while Carol's standing at the corners of Main Street and Washington and despairing, Sinclair Lewis uses a neat little author's technique and he introduces us to another character, basically a minor character, but this character is also a new arrival to Gopher Prairie, and she sees things 180 degrees differently than Carol does. And that's B. Sorensen, who is a Scandinavian immigrant, and she's leaving her farm somewhere in Minnesota and coming to the big city Gopher Prairie. And she's going to look for work there. And as it happens, she gets off the train at the same time as Carol. And they're both walking down Main Street at the very same moment. And B is just amazed at this metropolis. Quoting, B stood at the corner of Main Street and Washington Avenue. The roar of the city began to frighten her. There were five automobiles on the street, all at the same time. Right, and Sinclair Lewis gives us a quote from B. As she marched up the street, she was meditating that it didn't hardly seem like it was possible there could be so many folks all in one place and all at the same time. Why, it would take years to get acquainted with them all and swell people too. A fine big gentleman in a new pink shirt with a diamond, a lovely lady in a lingerie dress. But it must be an awful hard dress to wash. 
Now, of course, the lovely lady that BCs is actually Carol Milford Kennicott on her first tour of Gopher Prairie as well. And these two are destined to have a bit of a relationship together. Well, simply, B becomes Carol's maid, and B actually becomes Carol's best friend in Gopher Prairie. B is very open, enthusiastic, and eager to learn, and Carol's very receptive to someone like that. The other people in Gopher Prairie don't quite have such an open mind. Well, to start with, they object to Carol paying B six dollars a week when they're only paying their helping girls five fifty or even five dollars a week. So this is not going to sit well with the established ladies of Gopher Prairie. Right. And that attitude is something that carries over to all the businesses and professions that operate in Gopher Prairie. They begin to see Carol as this girl from the big city come to a small town to look down her nose at them. She's even buying couches from out of town. She won't go and shop at the local stores, and now she's paying her help an exorbitant weekly rate. And things are going to get worse, aren't they? Will may have said, come to Gopher Prairie and boss us. But I don't think he was speaking for most of the women in the Jolly 17. Yeah, the Jolly 17. It's a group of women who meet for lunch and cards on a weekly basis. But we're given the impression that there's trouble right from the beginning. Everybody is polite, and they're excited to have someone new in town. Her next-door neighbor is a woman named Mrs. Bogart. That's the widow Bogart. She comes over to be friendly to Carol. And this is her definition of friendly. Quote, Well, I hope you and your husband won't have any troubles with sickness and quarreling and wasting money and all that. So many of these young people do. But I must be running along, dearie. It's been such a pleasure. Katie, I'm glad you brought up uh, the widow Bogart because I have a great quote from the book that describes her, and it's actually one of my favorite quotes from the novel. Let me just read that for you. Mrs. Bogart lived across the alley from the rear of Carol's house. She was a widow and a prominent Baptist. And by the way, prominent Baptist is in capital letters. To continue the quote, and she's a good influence. By the way, good influence is in capital letters. She had so painfully reared three sons to be Christian gentlemen that one of them had become an Omaha bartender, one a professor of Greek, and one, Cyrus Bogart, a boy of 14 who was still at home, the most brazen member of the toughest gang in Boytown. Now, a little bit later in our novel, both Mrs. Bogart and Cyrus will play a rather important role, but we're going to put them on hold for a little while and get back to talking about how Carol and Gopher Prairie get along. There comes a point where Carol decides she's going to give a party, but, you know, she's been to one or two of these Gopher Prairie parties, and she wants to make some changes. First, though, Peter, tell me a little bit about what she encounters at these Gopher Prairie parties. Well, usually the host will come out and he'll say, okay, folks, let's have some stunts. Which gets Carol's hopes going. How exciting. These people do have fun. They do interesting things at parties. Sure. And the stunts range from somebody reciting some poem to somebody singing a song, all repeated ad nauseum. That's right. Every party she goes to, it's the same characters who come out with the same stunts. But Carol's going to change that. She's going to throw a party, and she's not going to have any stunts. Well, she's going to have stunts, but they're going to be new stunts. Carol presents a Japanese-themed party. When it's time for the games, she has new, fun, interesting games planned. New and fun to her. Well, apparently, the people there enjoyed them, too. One involved everybody taking off their shoes— the shoes being hidden in a room, and all the lights being turned off. Then, the people crawl around the room to find their shoes. At some point, the joke of the game is the light gets flipped back on and you see everybody in these ridiculous positions. And it just makes everybody laugh and loosen everyone up. And they did. They laughed and they had a great time. And it was so different. And now Carol thinks she's made a hit, maybe made a small contribution to change in Gopher Prairie. However, about a week or two later, there's another party and... Then the one man stands up and says his poem, and the other man sings a song, and food is served, and they all go home. Quoting the book, The circle of mourners kept its place all evening, and Dave Dyer did the stunt of the Norwegian and the hen. And Carol realizes she hasn't made a change at all. No, they've endured her. Yes, exactly. And unfortunately, this party is going to be about the highlight of her stay in Gopher Prairie. Well, winter sets in after this party, and she enthusiastically tries to organize bobsledding and outdoor activities, which the women smile, and they say, Oh, Carol, this is wonderful, but they're not going to do it again. 
She does try one more attempt to make a change. She starts a little drama club. Uh, she again thinks she's starting to make a contribution to Gopher Prairie, but this also fails miserably. Although they do get one play performed. But she quickly realizes that they're all out there just sort of hamming it up for their friends and neighbors in the audience. They're not in it for personal growth. Oh, that's for sure. But all these things are after Carol has tried to bring about real reform in the town. And Sinclair Lewis says throughout the book that there's nothing special about Gopher Prairie. It's no worse than any other small town anywhere in the world. He even goes beyond small towns. He says this will happen in the big city as well. Because these behaviors are products of human nature. And it's about this time that Gopher Prairie is going to get two new citizens. But before we introduce these two characters into our discussion, I'd like to take a quick break to talk about another podcast that I think you'll love to hear about. It's the Professional Book Nerds Podcast. If you enjoy listening to novel conversations, I think you'll really enjoy this podcast too. The Professional Book Nerds Podcast offers up book recommendations and interviews your favorite authors every Monday and Thursday. Both Jill Grunenwald and Adam Sokol have spent their careers in the book world and have an inside look on exciting books you're going to love. In addition to their twice-a-week episodes, each month they preview the best new books coming out you're sure to love. They're not just book nerds. They're professional book nerds. Visit professionalbooknerds.com and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Or check them out on our sister station, evergreenpodcast.com. All right, before we took our break, I threw out two new citizens of Gopher Prairie, and these two people really precipitate all the rest of the actions that Carol's going to take. And these two citizens are Fern and Eric. Peter, tell us a little bit more about these two. Well, Eric is a tailor. He's come to work in one of the shops in town, and he's described as a bit of a dandy. He's a bit of a dandy. They really don't know what to make of an 18-year-old kid off the farm who's dressing in suits and ties and spats. And he dreams of being a designer of women's dresses. Exactly. But that doesn't go over too well for a farm boy in Minnesota at the turn of the century. But for Carol, she sees a kindred spirit here. She sees someone who's interested in reading, who's interested in poetry. And he is looking for somebody to mentor him a little bit, which Carol sort of enjoys. But at the same time, wishes she could be at that point in her life again. She wishes she had had a mentor when she got to Gopher Prairie, and and maybe she wouldn't be so unhappy. And Katie, do you want to tell me a little bit about Fern? Well, Fern came down to be a teacher. Fern was well-read, not overly... Conventional, shall we say? Yeah, and excited about having fun parties and making life enjoyable. And like Carol, she was a little apprehensive once she got to Gopher Prairie. But what's important, Carol is like her. They're not willing to give up parts of their own personality to get along in Gopher Prairie. So let's talk a little bit about what happens to Eric in Gopher Prairie. He's never accepted. No, people just think he's kind of odd. But to Carol, he's such a light of the big world out there that she tries to mentor him. She tries to convince herself that she's in love with Eric and that they might embark on an affair. But we never buy that as readers, and she actually never buys it herself, does she? No. As we've said, we've got a lot of her interior thoughts, and just when she thinks she really does love Eric, another thought comes into her mind. Why? And how does Dr. Will take to her having this new relationship with an 18-year-old dandy? Well, that's one of the problems for Carol. For Carol? Yeah, because Will doesn't pay any attention to it at all. He doesn't play his role as the outraged husband. He sort of ignores them. Yeah, we keep calling it the affair or an affair, but there's no physical intimacy. However, in town, they're using the word affair, aren't they? Absolutely. Carol's using it because there's a disloyalty going on. And when Will does call her on it, it's not as a jealous husband. It's almost like a fatherly attitude he takes with her. You know, like, well, you have to put this silliness aside. And he's sort of above it all. Basically, his attitude towards Carol is, I know nothing's going on, but think of how this looks to the town. All right, so let's get back to Eric. He's not really long for Gopher Prairie. He leaves within about 24 hours. I'm exaggerating a little, and never to be seen again. Correct. All right, Katie, Peter, while this was going on with Eric, Fern Mullins was also having some drama of her own. And this is how Sinclair Lewis gets us to it. Quote, Through early autumn, Fern Mullins was the only person who broke the suspense. The frivolous teacher had come to accept Carol as of her own youth. 
And though school had begun, she rushed in daily to suggest dances, Welsh rabbit parties. Fern even begged her to go as a chaperone to a barn dance in the country on a Saturday evening. Carol could not go. And then the next day, a storm crashes. Katie, you want to tell us a little bit about that barn, that dance, and that storm? Yeah, this was a party outside of town. Fern desperately wanted to go. She asked Carol to go. Carol didn't go, but Cy Bogart was willing to go. Now, Cy was one of Fern's students. Cy is also the son of... The Widow Bogart. The Widow Bogart. And... She's Fern's landlady. Fern's landlady. So, Fern knew maybe this isn't such a great idea. And I think that's why she asked Carol to go along as a chaperone. Absolutely. But she was desperate to go, and Sinclair Lewis says she had gone to the party not quite liking Cy, but willing to endure him for the sake of dancing. And Cy promised to be good. And of course, Cy is not good. Nope. Nope. He steals a flask of whiskey from a farmer's coat. He gets drunk. He misbehaves with Fern. He tries to kiss her. And then he gets sick. So Fern has to drive him home back to Mrs. Bogart's, all the while fending off his clumsy advances. And she says, quote, I felt quite heroic while I was driving the buggy back that night and keeping Sai away from me. I guess I expected the people in Gopher Prairie to admire me. Hi there. I'm Heather Drago. And I'm Sarah Saunders. We host the podcast, That's a Hard No, about saying no and setting boundaries. So you can become that true and empowered you that this world needs. Saying no isn't just okay. It's the key to living an authentic, fulfilling life. I'm a licensed professional clinical counselor. So while this podcast is in no way a replacement for one-on-one therapy, I suppose I know what I'm talking about. I'd say so. We talk about learning to say no and set healthy boundaries and how it impacts mental health, physical health, relationships, parenthood, and more. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and visit our website, hardnopodcast.com. We're here to help you find your no and say it unapologetically. That's a hard no. They didn't. And this is where the storm crashes. Yes. We really find out the story the next day when the widow Bogart comes crashing into Carol and Dr. Will's house and proceeds to relate this entire story about the barn dance and what happened with Cy and Fern. Well, according to Mrs. Bogart, Fern took him up to this barn dance, got him drunk, and then... Tried to take advantage of him. Yeah, exactly. And, of course, Mrs. Bogart has thrown Fern out of the house and has now made the rounds of all the prominent people in town. And of course, the story she spreads continues to grow and grow. At one point, it goes from being a flask to a bottle of whiskey to three bottles of whiskey. No, two cases. (laughs) Two cases of whiskey. Yeah, and who knows how many boys were corrupted. But the whole town knows Cy better than Mrs. Bogart knows him. And when Bogart comes to tell the story to Carol and Will... Will tries to say that to Bogart. Yeah, Lewis wrote for Will, Oh, for God's sake, quit it. You haven't any idea what happened. You haven't given us a single proof yet that Fern is anything but a rattle-brained youngster. Dr. Will and Carol don't believe her for a minute, not from the beginning. But it makes no difference to Mrs. Bogart or pretty much anybody else in town. Because it's all about appearances. Mrs. Bogart is the prominent Baptist. With capital letters. With capital P, capital B. (laughs) Fern is run out of town. The school board votes and she doesn't get a single vote, even though they all know what the true story is. And Will knows that. And that's why he doesn't do any more than he does. Dr. Will knows what Gopher Prairie is like. Exactly. And he tried to warn Carol about this whole thing with Eric. It doesn't really matter what the truth is. It matters what the people believe. And so therefore, now Fern and Eric are both gone from Gopher Prairie. And now things are going to go from bad to worse for Carol. So Carol pretty much states that she's leaving town. She's not trying to say that she's leaving Will or anything. She just needs to leave town. You know, get out of town for a while. I'd like to add, a son has been born to Carol and Dr. Will, and that's pretty much all we know about this child that supposedly they both love. And actually, it's just about as abrupt in the novel as we just made it here in our conversation. Correct. 
All right, so Carol's got to leave, and she's going to go with or without Dr. Will. Where did they decide to go, and what did they decide to do? California. California. And Dr. Will goes with her. Of course. We don't hear much about the trip overall, except they have a lovely time, and they see all sorts of wonderful things. And Carol sees Will interested in architecture, interested in some of the theater that they go to. Some of it. And she thinks this is what she needed. Good. Now he'll help me when we go back. Turns out they're actually gone for three and a half months. And Carol is a little uneasy during their trip because while Will does seem to take some interest in the architecture and the sites, his conversation also seems to be about the color of the cars out here in the West. They have different colors for their cars. And if he runs into somebody from a small town like theirs, they want to talk about if the hunting is good. Right. And the weather, right? The conversation about the weather is just as present during their trip to California as it was during their entire stay in Gopher Prairie. And that hasn't changed too much. That's what we all use to try to get through conversations, at least with strangers. Katie, I will grant you that. But for Carol, it's an indication that maybe things aren't as changed as she had hoped they would be. True. And Dr. Will's not back a half hour from California, and what does he start talking about with his neighbor? The cars and the weather. Oh, sure. Quote, you should have seen the cars we saw out in California. And now Carol immediately knows nothing's changed. And so, because nothing's changed, Carol goes back to her house, kisses her baby, thanks the aunt for babysitting, and makes the most important decision of her life. She's leaving, and she's leaving without Dr. Will. She decides to go to Washington, D.C., ostensibly to get a job in the War Department somewhere. Now, unfortunately for Carol, or fortunately, the First World War is just coming to an end. But she does take Hugh the baby, and she heads east. And she does find a clerking job in one of the official war offices. It was the Bureau of War Risk Insurance. That's right. And she tries to create a life for herself and her son, and doesn't really do a bad job, does she? No, no. She's rooming with several other girls. She starts to go out to some restaurants. She goes out a couple of evenings to different concerts. Now she's doing for herself. She doesn't have to get the $20 allowance from Dr. Will every week. If she wants to go out and buy a dress or she wants to go to a new restaurant, she can do it. She doesn't have to ask anyone's permission. She doesn't worry about what the townspeople think. She's living the life she had hoped she would find for herself in Gopher Prairie. Right, good point. So, Katie, is it finally happily ever after for Carol? Of course not. Uh. About 13 months after she's in Washington, her husband comes to visit her. And we should note that they've never talked of divorce. That's not what's going on here. She just wants to spread her wings a little bit. So he comes to see her, and she's confused about her feelings about him. Dr. Will has come to town, and he's making an effort. This is how it's described in the novel. Quote, She realized in the taxi cab that he was wearing a soft gray suit, a soft easy hat, a flippant tie. And he says, Do you like the new outfit? Got him in Chicago. Gosh, I hope they're the kind you like. And then they spend about a half an hour or so at Carol's flat with their son, Yu. And Carol realizes that he had had his new tan shoes polished to a luster. There was a recent cut on his chin. He must have shaved on the train just before coming into town. It was pleasant to feel how important she was and how many people she recognized as she took him to the Capitol, as she told him how many feet it was to the top of the dome, as she pointed out Senator La Follette and the vice president. So he's come to town and he's making an effort. Is she smitten again? Well, she's interested anyway. But true to his character, Will is very clear-eyed about what he's there to do and what he needs from Carol. He suggested sort of a second honeymoon. And then he says, well, maybe not a honeymoon, but a second wooing, as if they're trying to start all over again. And they actually leave Washington and go down to the Carolinas for a week or two. Well, Will comes out flatly and says to her that he's not going to ask Carol to come back to Gopher Prairie with him. He would have liked that, but he's not going to ask her to do that because he tells her he realizes that she has to want to come back to Gopher Prairie. So, Katie, he's not really sweeping her off her feet. No, and he knows that won't work with her now. But this is where Carol recognizes her responsibility to her child. So it takes her about five more months, but she accepts that her life is going to have to be in Gopher Prairie. Is this a maturing for Carol? I think she's come to realize that she has to find it in herself, what's going to make her happy and what she's going to do about that. I also think she recognizes that her happiness is not everything. Mm. 
You know, as I was reading this novel, I kept waiting to see how Carol was going to change Gopher Prairie. Turns out, really, Gopher Prairie changes Carol. Well, there are changes in Gopher Prairie, though, and we find out, while she was in Washington, a new school was being built. Now, that was one of the projects early on that was talked about, but of course, the more sober minds in town said, well, it's going to take some time. People won't want to be taxed to build a new city hall or a new school and all that. But of course, Carol doesn't want to wait for anything. She wants to fly into town and have this new building up overnight. But persistent hard work has started to cause, uh, even without her, some of the changes that she wanted to make in Gopher Prairie. And I believe that Sinclair Lewis is hinting at when Carol goes back, she will have to make more effective changes because she's calmer, because she recognizes that change is going to have to come in smaller spurts, and she's going to have children that are a part of the community. Katie, I'm glad you brought up the fact that Sinclair Lewis is giving us these hints, because what I want to do now is talk about what Sinclair Lewis is really saying in this novel. A couple of the things I think Sinclair Lewis wanted us to get out of this novel are, first, your perspective determines how you feel about things. A perfect example that he uses in the novel are Carol and B coming to town on the same day. To Carol, it's a small, desolate, dirty town. She doesn't think she's ever going to be happy here. To B, she walks down that same main street and she can't get over how big this town is. It's got a movie theater with new movies every day. Yeah, but B's story is heartbreaking. B comes to this town so excited. And despite the way people treat her, she still loves it. She's going to make the best of it. And she does, until a very sad end. So be sure to pay attention to B when you read this book. Katie, you're right. Obviously, in an hour's conversation, we can't touch on everything that's in this novel. We can't talk about every character. And this is quite an extensive novel. As we've said, it goes from St. Paul to Gopher Prairie to California to Washington, D.C. And we can't talk about everything that happens. But in the time remaining, what I really want to get to is what Sinclair Lewis is trying to tell us about small-town America. There's a passage where he addresses the narrow-mindedness of small towns. Uh, Carol and Will are sitting at dinner with Will's aunt and uncle, really sort of an older, insufferable couple. I would like to stress insufferable. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Right. Here's a passage, quote, with a loose-lipped, superior village smile, Uncle Whittier hinted, what's this I hear about your thinking Gopher Prairie ought to be all torn down and rebuilt, Carrie? I don't know where folks get these newfangled ideas. And then a little later on, he says, In a manner of one who had just beheld a two-headed calf, they repeated that they had never heard such funny ideas. They were staggered to learn that a real tangible person living in Minnesota and married to their own flesh-and-blood relation could apparently believe that divorce may not always be immoral, that illegitimate children do not bear any special and guaranteed form of curse and that there are ethical authorities outside of the Hebrew Bible, that men have drunk wine yet not died in the gutter, that the capitalistic system of distribution and the Baptist wedding ceremony were not known in the Garden of Eden, and that there are ministers of the gospel who accept evolution, that there is not a universal custom to wear scratchy flannels next to the skin in winter. Where does she get all of them theories? So marveled Uncle Whittier, while Aunt Bessie inquired, Do you suppose there's many folks got notions like hers? My, if there are, and her tone settled the fact that there were not. I just don't know what the world is coming to. (laughs) But, But Sinclair Lewis doesn't just stop there. It's not only in small towns that you find small mindedness. Here's a quote from Carol that Sinclair Lewis uses, I think, to show us that this kind of attitude can be found anywhere. This is Carol, I quote, Oh, if she was to perceive in Washington, as doubtless she would have perceived in New York or London, a thick streak of Main Street, that cautious dullness of a gopher prairie appearing in boarding houses where ladylike bureau clerks gossip with polite young officers about the movies, a thousand Sam clerks or a few widow Bogarts were to be identified in the Sunday motor procession, in theater parties and at the dinners of state societies, small-mindedness will be found anywhere. In fact, Sinclair Lewis also has one of his other characters state that 
even in a big city, you're only going to know a few hundred people. And for all intents and purposes, you could be living in a small town. Actually, that's Carol that says that. At one point, she recognizes in Gopher Prairie, she really only knows about 50 people or so. And there are 3,000. Exactly. And another element of viciousness in the novel is Lewis's sense of humor. His writing has a very cutting edge to it. There was another passage, also with Will and Carol sitting at the dinner table, and the insufferable Uncle Whittier is launching into another story with the words that I think we've all heard at one point or another, why, when I was his age. (laughs) And then, as Uncle Whittier starts to go on, quote, Carol reflected that the carving knife would make an excellent dagger with which to kill Uncle Whittier. (laughs) It would slide in easily. The headlines would be terrible. Later, as Uncle Whittier finishes up his story, which he'd probably told a thousand times, quote, Carol again studied the carving knife. Blood on the whiteness of a tablecloth might be gorgeous. That is a great line. <laughs> Close quotes. You got it. <laughs> that is a great line. But I think the biggest problem for Carol about living a small town life is that they didn't see that and they didn't know how dull it was. She says, quote, it is an unimaginably standardized background a sluggishness of speech and manners, a rigid ruling of the spirit by the desire to appear respectable. It is the contentment, the contentment of the quiet dead who are scornful of the living, for their restless walking. It is slavery, self-sought and self-defended, a savior list, people gulping tasteless food and sitting afterwards, coatless and thoughtless in rocking chairs, prickly with inane decorations, listening to mechanical music, saying mechanical things about the excellence of Ford automobiles, and viewing themselves as the greatest race in the world. And that's really the issue, isn't it? We all have these foibles. We all have these prejudices. We all have these moments of narrow-mindedness. But Sinclair Lewis is telling us it's our egos that get in the way. We think we're the best. No matter how small we may appear, we always think we're doing things for the right reasons, sometimes with disastrous results. And Carol seems to be the only character in the book that is able to see outside of herself and even recognize those qualities in herself. Actually, there are a couple other characters who used to have ideas, used to have dreams, but... They got the village virus. True. And she speaks to one who actually says, quote, I came to town with enthusiasm and ideas, and I slowly, over time, got the village virus. And I have to quote that she's talking to a lawyer in town. Quote, she had this sense that he had bigger dreams. Once had had bigger dreams. Right. And he says that, The village virus is the germ which infects ambitious people who stay too long in the provinces. You'll find it epidemic among lawyers and doctors and ministers and college-bred merchants and all these people who have had a glimpse of the world that think and laugh but have returned to their swamp. I'm a perfect example. Well, that begs the question then at the end of the novel. Is Carol going back to that swamp? Has she caught the village virus? No, she's going back clear-eyed and prepared to deal with it as it comes, not necessarily become one with the town. So maybe not happily ever after, but contentedly ever after? Yeah, right. But I've got to tell you, there's one line that I don't even have to read, but I will always remember. It's a description of Carol. She was a woman with a working brain and no work. I think that's really part of her problem and really a big part of America's problem during this time. All right, as I said before, there's far too much in this novel to get to in one hour, and we are going to have to stop here. Uh, I do want to thank my readers today, Katie Smith and Peter Toomey. Katie, Peter, thank you. Thanks, Frank. I'm thrilled to be on the show with you. Thank you very much. You've been listening to Novel Conversations. Novel Conversations is a production of the Front Porch People. For more information about upcoming Novel Conversations, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast app. Or go to our website at thefrontporchpeople.com. And if you like the podcast, don't forget to leave us a review. It really helps. A special thanks to producer Julie Fink, audio engineers Sean Ruhlhoffman, Eric Coltnow, and Dave Douglas, and executive producer Joan Andrews. We'd also like to thank our researchers, Patrick and Joan Andrews. And I'm your host, Frank Lavallo. Until next time, I hope you find yourself in a novel conversation. 
Hear Her Sports is a podcast for everyone who loves stories by and about women striving to improve and make a difference in their lives. I am your host, Elizabeth Emery, a former professional cyclist. In every episode, I introduce a female athlete or woman in the business of sport through a thoughtful conversation about who they are and the terrific work they're doing. My guests and I explore the glorious and frustrating issues in sports, history, equity, training, nutrition, and so much more. Join us for inspiration, for community, and for love of being a strong athletic woman. This podcast was produced with the support of the Ohio Motion Picture Tax Credit and in partnership with the Ohio Development Services Agency.